Welcome to another episode of Colubrid and Colubroid Radio. This is a pretty special episode because in this episode, we have for the first time our new co-host when Matt can't be present or I can't be present, Blimp Bartley. So how you doing, man? Oh, man, I'm doing great, buddy. How are you? I'm I'm happy that it's the end of the day and I get to talk about snakes because today was a little bit brutal and this is the best part of it. So, yeah, but um, I guess we should talk about why Clint's here. Uh, Matt is busy with work. And like we alluded to in the last episode, um, we kind of realized that between Matt and I that we and we want to try to get the podcast out in a predictive once every two week format. And we knew we had to have somebody that could pitch, pitch, pitch hit for us when we needed someone and we couldn't think of anybody better than Clint. So with that being said, thanks for uh, coming on board, man. Happy that uh, you're here. Zach, buddy, I-, I tell you, I am completely honored. I, I mean, I was... Uh... I was thrilled to be asked. Um, I and everyone who's listened to the podcast knows, you know, that I, I'm friends with each of you. And uh, but I, I say this not as a friend; I say it as a fan. I, I just think the <laughs> show has been phenomenal. Um, well, I, I love. I mean, it. I love what's been done with taking the the science, the anatomy, the biology, and weaving it with culture and the keeping and the tips and the tricks and uh, you guys have done so well at taking those two pieces uh, of what we do and making it where it's relatable where it's easy to listen to where it, it doesn't matter which side of that coin you fall on it this is entertaining it, it's you know you learn new things so um, I, I really do mean it I, I'm a huge fan and I am so happy to to be here Looking yeah well we're I can speak for Matt, even though he's not here, that we're quite happy to have you here. Um, and thank you for the kind words. So with our housekeeping piece, uh, we always just kind of go over what has been going on in our world. And literally, absolutely nothing new has happened in my world except for, and I put it up on social media today, um, my brown musarana showed up, which is paraphomoth, paraphomoth, paraphomothis. That's hard to say. Rusticus. Uh, it's a wonderful brown snake. <laughs> it, the, you have to be a true snake nerd to like uh, brown musaranas. Um, but when I was working on the book, we, uh, yeah, I, I, well, not we, but I spent a tremendous amount of time reading about them. They were in the trade about a decade or two ago, and they've kind of disappeared. And it's one of those classic examples of something that we used to have, but then nobody really worked with it. And now they're pretty much gone um and there's just a handful of people that have them so as soon as one popped up i snagged it incredibly fast and now it's here and it's totally living up to my expectations um it pounded a rat with a small rat within maybe 20 minutes of being here so um in fact i keep it in this office it is literally right over there that's why i keep looking that dire- direction uh other than that though absolutely nothing really novels going on we're in the middle of january uh it's finally snowing here and cold so i wanted to stay that way so the animals that are brewmating can actually get you know the the good effects of of winter time but yeah that's it so since we talked with you last on the podcast you kind of dedicated your life to <laughs> urban culture literally so tell us a little bit about your shop and and like what you're doing now compared to, to where you were during episode one. Oh my gosh. I'll tell you what, this past year has hands down been the, the busiest uh, year of my life. And one of the, the biggest uh, changing years, I guess, you know, um, uh, years I've ever had. So since we last talked, um, decided to, to really move forward in a big way. I mean, I think so many of us who are in the hobby, um, we've always had that dream, you know, mm-hmm. of, of having a shop, of having that 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 storefront, or really that place where we were doing this all the time. And it's a lot of doors opened that kept telling me, if you're going to, mm-hmm. here here's your chance, here's your shot. Um, you know, part of that was the fact that the the space here in my home just I outgrew it, you know, we didn't yep. have any, any more uh, space. So talked with the family and we ended up uh, purchasing a 9,000 square foot facility 
and uh, with 3,000 square foot uh, retail showrooms. So with that, um, wow, wow. <laughs> um, the, the amount of time that it uh, took just to kind of gut it and, and lay everything mm-hmm. out the way we wanted to. Um, and there's a lot of surprises along the way when, when starting uh, I couldn't even business. begin to imagine uh, the things it's, that I mean, a lot of that you don't know are coming. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, we have an <laughs> ongoing joke that everything's $1,000. Every every <laughs> business thing you need, it's going to, that's the minimum. Um, but it's uh, it's been it's been a great, uh, great experience so far. Um, I've had some uh, excellent reception from the community, from um, the, the the hobby as a whole, um, and it's uh, it's it's just been dynamite. We, as far as like the collection, you know, things like that, I will tell you, it looks a lot different today than mm-hmm. it did a year ago. Um, still have everything that we had discussed before. You know, none of that's going away. But obviously, with a storefront, I had to take on a lot of new things um, yeah. that really I hadn't been into much before. So instead of just the, you know, the the rat snakes, the milk snakes, the king snakes, you know, all the cluberts, um, now we've got dart frogs, we've got <laughs> bearded dragons, we've got cresties, we've got chameleons, mm-hmm. we've got tortoises of you know various species. We, it's it's been fun to learn you know even some of these are are starter species but i just never really i wasn't a lizard guy now i'm finding out i really like them (laughs) there you go um, you know just a lot of that kind of stuff so uh you know and i'm sure in future future episodes we'll go into a lot more depth but yeah to to say the least it's been uh been fantastic uh it's been a wild ride the past year no I, i couldn't begin to imagine i mean i I had to create a giant collection from nowhere. So I, I kind of understand that piece, but I was using the university's money. <laughs> so it wasn't like, <laughs> it, and, you know, I didn't want to get yelled at and go over budget, but it's like a completely different thing when it's, you know, it's literally your livelihood. So it, it takes a bit of courage to make that jump. And I just want to publicly said that, uh, that's, that's pretty badass that you did that. And, and like you said, it seems like your reception has been good. So, Hopefully the yeah, trains will keep has. trucking down the track. Yeah, I think uh, nice. this year we're we've got a lot of things planned out, and uh, it's I think it's going to be a great year. Twenty twenty three is going to be be excellent for us. Awesome. Well, Matt has mentioned to me multiple times, and I agree with him that it'd be really cool to have an episode where you actually talk about the transition from private sector to you know livelihood, basically. Um, yeah. And, and we'll have to do that in the future. Uh, might be cool Absolutely. to let you. I mean, you're not. Are you, are you a year in yet? No, you're no, not we close um, to that point, right? No, That's we like opened August. the doors. Yeah, August thirteenth of uh, last year is when we officially opened the doors and uh, have just continued to build uh, up on it. I mean, and it wasn't until December that I officially stepped away from my 20 year career, uh, <laughs> that security, you know, uh-huh, that, yeah. that guaranteed paycheck and uh, uh-huh. such a way to be able to do this full time. So, um, you know, crossing fingers that I, I'm as smart as I think I am. Right. You know, <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah, I hear you. <laughs> oh man. All righty. Well, any other updates other than that giant life cho- life change? I mean, that's kind of a, a little one, I guess. Maybe massive. That's been, I'll tell you, that's really been all of it. Um, I, I, This is the first time in my life that I don't have a reptile in the house. I mean, it's really it's odd. Yeah, so, so it's, the whole it's collection very, very moved. odd. And wow. that was an undertaking. I trust me. I can't imagine what that's, that was like. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. For those I who can't don't, imagine. Yeah, it's uh, because we're talking, I think there was somewhere around, including babies, five, six hundred animals to move. Mm -hmm. And they were all downstairs. That's yeah, it didn't happen at once. It took months for me to get everything over there. Yeah, I've had to. uh, I've been sitting in my office and and maintenance will show up and they'll be like, "Uh, we got to do the electrical in that room. So you got to get everything out and then. I'd be like, what? What? <laughs> They're like, yeah. yeah, and do it in the next two hours. I'm like, that is not how this works. Um, <laughs> but but 
that was like one room that had probably a hundred animals in it. So moving six or seven hundred's got to be insane. Well, you did it. So congrats on it being done. Did you like sit in a corner and stare at the wall when it was done for like days on end? Oh no. <laughs> well, that was one of the uh, selling points to being able to do this was. I told the family because we had a decision to make. It was either yeah. we build the house out on a, the property that we have that we've been wanting to do for years or we go in this direction. Uh, but whenever I kind of pitch the idea of think about it with all the reptiles gone, think about how much room we're going to have here. <laughs> the kids are going to have their whole play area down there. Mm -hmm. We're going to get our house back, you know. And so, uh, yeah, that's that empty wall didn't last long. Now it's yeah, with toys yeah. and, and all that fun mm -hmm. stuff. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All righty. Well, you ready to jump in with PJ? Let's do it. All right, cool. So our guest tonight is PJ. Refresh me on your last name, man. It's Cone. Cone. Cone, just yes. like ice cream cone. Ice cream cone. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> PJ Cone of Handmade Herps. Um, PJ's been on a, at least one other podcast. I know you were on with THP, correct? Correct, yeah. Yes, that was that was actually my favorite episode of last year. So there you go. Um, so anywho, we are going to be talking with PJ about rat snakes today, uh, specifically rhino rats uh, because he's he's kept those, but he's also kept things like Molendorfi uh, and a handful of others. Uh, and then we're also going to segue for like the second hour of conversation with PJ and and discuss black milk snakes. We haven't really talked about Gage yet. And we thought no one better than PJ. And we were always trying to get something new on the uh, our episodes. So if you like black milks, you like rhinos, and you like Asian rats in general, this is going to be a good episode for you. So our, our classic kind of um, first question is, what's where'd you get your start? How, how, how did you end up with a house that has snakes? In it? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I have always been interested in animals. I was that little kid that could spout off all the animal facts. And I think something else I was interested in as a kid that really ended up tying itself closely to uh, having a reptile collection in the future was I was super into Pokemon as well. Um, and just learning all the facts about those and all the different creatures and animals eventually segued into uh, herp collecting and being able to kind of have Pokemon in real life because there's so many uh, different cool uh, snakes and, and reptiles to collect. But interestingly enough, I have a house full of snakes now, but for a good portion of my life, I actually was somewhat hesitant, almost a little bit fearful about snakes because growing up, my parents weren't really into them. So I, I learned all the scary things about them as a kid and uh, was fascinated by them, but had a, a healthy fear of them, one would say. But when I turned 18, I uh, got my first reptile, actually a leopard gecko. And I went to Michigan State University and I took that with me, snuck it into the dorm rooms and everything, and eventually got involved in the herpetology club there. And um, so I studied zoology while I was at Michigan State as well. So in the club, I just got to meet a bunch of other reptile keepers and um met people that had snakes, got to learn about their snakes, hold some of them. And so slowly those misconceptions started coming down. And I would say the time that it really turned for me was I had an internship at a nature center and they had several snakes in their collection there that I got to care for and work with on a daily basis. So that, that hands-on opportunity really flipped the switch for me. And that curiosity became all out fascination. And I just deep dived and learned as much as I could. Um, and that eventually led to, let's see, in my last year of college, um, I went to my first Tinley Expo. That would have been, I think, spring 2012. And I actually picked up my first snake ever, which was a, a hatchling rhino rat snake. So you guys know how it is. And many of the people listening know how it is. You get one and uh, you got you got to get another one to go with it. And then you like this other species and it just keeps going from there. I've often said that uh, no one has four reptiles. You have one, <laughs> right. two, three, 19, 20, yeah. 21. You know, just that that's how it jumps. So 
Uh, PJ, yeah. just real quick, because uh, this is always is something that kind of fascinates me whenever I talk to individuals. You said that your parents were never into them. They, they didn't like the snakes. So now that you are into them to the degree you are, what do your parents think now? Yeah, I mean, they're super supportive of what I do. I'm sure they're thrilled it's not in their house. But uh, whenever a family comes over, like, that's always one of the things. Like, especially now, my nieces and nephews, they always want to go in the snake room. And my parents come in as well. Um, my dad holds them. My mom, I, I can't remember if she's ever actually, like, held one on her own, but she'll pet them. She'll look at them. And we keep coming back to the rhinos. Those specifically are always one that it doesn't matter who it is coming in the room. Like, if they are not at all into snakes, that's at least one that they say, now that is an attractive snake like that blue green color just always mm -hmm. gets everybody and the horn is so interesting so it's just something that makes them take a second look and and look at, look a little bit closer and and uh find some of the beauty in it very cool very very cool so another question for you is what what does your collection what's what's it look like now yeah so it's all colubrids and well colubroids now there's a yep. a portion of hognose in there but for the the rat snakes i've got uh rhinoceros rat snakes russians molendorfi black milks and taiwan beauties and the bulk of that right now is probably the russian rat snakes i actually have 18 individuals um mostly wild type but i just recently this year brought in some albinos, azanthics, and some melanistics as well, or het melanistics. So I think the high contrast black and yellow with the Russians will always be my favorite, but I love playing around with some morphs as well. And not a lot has been done with the Russian morphs. So looking forward to that coming up in the future. But yeah, the Molendorfi, just a pair, black milks, just a pair. Um, I'm up to six rhinos now and yeah, handful of hognose projects going on. Man, didn't realize you liked the Russians as much. <laughs> oh, I love them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Funny enough, like I've had, I haven't produced Russian since I think 2019. It's just been like <laughs> dud clutch and then a moldy clutch and then the male was too skinny. So I gave him the year off. So big things are coming though. <laughs> you know, I have to say as far as the, your first snake jumping into a rhino, yeah, you know that's that's not typically a yeah. My first snake no. was a you know not, I don't really hear that often. So, sure, hey, you said you picked it up at Tinley, correct? I did. Yep. So out of the hundreds of thousands of animals <laughs> at, at Tinley, what made you stop at the rhino? What what grabbed you there? Well, so I or wasn't did you go even there for rhino. Had you already done I, your research? No, on I I went. Uh, you know the classic going to a reptile show just to look kind of thing. Uh -huh. But I feel like that statement had a little bit more credibility, being that I did not have any snakes before, but I wanted to go see what it was all about. And I didn't expect to see a rhino there at all. Um, I had seen them online on YouTube, thought they were super awesome, heard about how simple the care requirements were. And then when I saw it, um, that was when I was like, uh, like I was in college at the time, but knew I'd be home in the summer and whatnot. So I was calling my parents, like, how mad would you be if I brought this into your house? And um, <laughs> convinced them into it and and got it. And I had a, a little critter keeper on my my desk in my dorm room and a crafty way to hide it whenever the the mm -hmm. RAs or or facilities was coming in. And um, yeah, I was lucky that this individual I got was feeding frozen thaw, pinky mice off the tongs fail proof. Um, I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit later about how even well-established babies can take a turn when they go to a new home and get really picky, but it ended up being a fantastic, uh, easy to care for first snake for me. Good golly. Very cool. That's like the people that decide to get a new Python and their first one's a green tree. It's like on the yeah. same level as that. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I've never kept green trees, but yeah, they, they mm -hmm. seem, super complex to me so i maybe just looked out it was meant to be all righty well one of our classic questions uh that we're going to ask before we jump into the like meat and potatoes of rhinos and pj um is you, you could have gotten any snake in the world 
and there's pythons and boas and uh, all those guys, and then the other snakes. But but what about colubrids? Why colubrids? Why is this the group of snakes that you've decided to settle on? So I have, yeah, sure. I kept pythons. I worked with boas. Um, I think something that initially really attracted me to colubrids and the old world rat snakes specifically was the cool climate that they can be kept at. Um, Cause that for a rhino was interesting to me in a dorm room. I didn't need heat lamps and all these things that were going to draw attention. Just a critter keeper at room temp did the trick. And so as that interest started to build, um, I was looking at like mandarins and uh, Thai bamboos, again, things that can kind of thrive at room temp. Cause I, so my first job out of college, I was a zookeeper, so I had no money. So I was trying to figure <laughs> out ways to keep the utilities down. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's just a lot of animals within this group that fit within those easy care requirements. And again, you get the unique varieties, the, the bright colors, um, almost like you have all these high-end morphs and paint jobs, but it's all just the natural wild types of the species. And I, I like their activity level as well. Um, yeah. Interesting to hold, interesting to show people, because a lot of people, even the the common pet owners that have a pet ball, ball python or corn snake at home, they're always interested to see what else is out there. And I thought it was cool to have a, a slightly more unique collection. Totally fair answer. Think, uh, you know, something you mentioned there is it kind of hit the nail uh, you know, on the head when it comes to Asians. Uh, I've, I, I can't tell you how many times I've said to someone, one of the great things about them is if you flipped a rock, it would look just like this underneath it, meaning mm -hmm. it, it's not a mutation. This is exactly what it would look like in the wild. Um, and, and they are definitely some of the most gorgeous out there. So absolutely right there, PJ. Nailed that one. Okay. So PJ and rhinos, we know the backstory uh, of how you got the first one, but like Clint alluded to, you get, one, two, three, four, 19, 38, 52. <laughs> so, and, and that's definitely the way. It's funny that you say that because uh, last year, if people listen to the show, they know that I had the King Snake Apocalypse. Um, and I had, I've actually had a Florida King since 2004, the same individual. And my friend bought it in 1999. He's still alive. Um, he's up here at the school. Very, very geriatric, but still kicking. Uh, but when I bought the Kings, I literally did what you said. I went from two and then I, I, I got two more and then I, I'm, I'm four, I was at six and then, um, he's my dealer. That's what I call him. Chris Montross <laughs> with Dark Horse. He's like, Hey, I got these locality Kings. I thought you'd like them. And I was like, okay. And then boom, I'm up to like 15. It was it, or 12. I think, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was nuts. And now I think I have every one of his King snakes except for two. So that's me. So you said that you don't, how many rhinos were you at? Six? Um, let's see. There's currently, no, currently seven actually that are, are part of like my full-time collection. And I've still got quite a few babies from last year. Yeah. Hold back some things. So how you got the one it's in the critter keeper. At what point did you make the decision? Eh, I like this thing. We might need more and I might need to make my own. Yeah, it was, um, within that next year. Uh, so I, I graduated school. Um, I saw someone online had had a clutch that actually hatched like on my birthday in August. So I'm like, <laughs> Oh, it's meant to be, I, I must get one. <laughs> um, and so I did. And, uh, that was a great learner rhino. It was a little bit more picky coming home and I had to learn how to do the fish and then tease feed it onto pinkies mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, but so at that same time, actually, I was getting super into ball pythons as well. Like I was, you know, this young and impressionable herper and like reptile radio mm -hmm. is huge in the Bush League Breeders Club. And I was all over that. Um, and I had, I don't know, maybe a dozen ball pythons and this pair of rhinos. And it was actually, uh, let's see, would have been around 2016. I actually had to get rid of all my animals take care of some life stuff um, and was with out reptiles for a time. But then 2017 came back to um, 
came back to keeping reptiles and the first thing i got was a a trio of rhino rat snakes so nice right back where i picked up or where i left off um and that same trip i actually brought home a pair of bamboos as well so i still have that trio of um of rhinos that i got in 2017 and actually a good friend of mine has the uh at least the male um rhino that i originally got back in i think it was 2014. oh cool so how do you how do you have them set up now you know i know you originally had them in the primitive keeper and i'm guessing as yep. adults you've upgraded <laughs> uh yeah i mean so so currently um and this is something that's in transition currently they're in racks um but this next uh spring i'm going to be investing in some uh some arboreal enclosures for the adults at least i think uh growing up and, and raising out they do fantastic in racks um and obviously they've been breeding in racks i've gotten clutches the past uh, two years that my current adults have been a breeding size. But again, when the snakes are that gorgeous and that inquisitive, um, I want to be able to walk into the room and enjoy looking at them and not just opening up tubs. I, I totally fair. agree. I've, uh, I've had a lot of success with green bush rat snakes in racks, but I can tell you uh, now we have, I've got a 1.3 group set up in a, um, uh, the, the biggest exoterra that they make, the 36 by 18 by 36, that's set up in a bioactive setup on display in the shop, and it gets the most attention. Uh, everybody oh, bet, yeah. wants to stand and, and watch these pretty green snakes, you know, move around. So, uh, yeah, I think displaying them definitely is a good idea. Uh, what I, I like to get a little more technical on some of these species. What bedding do you use? Um, so I, for the longest time, was using like Reptichip or any sort of coconut mm -hmm. chunk type bedding. Uh, just the past few months, I've been trying out cypress mulch. Um, I know that's something a lot of people use consistently and seems to work well. I notice cypress mulch dries out a lot quicker, so I'm not totally sure what I'm going to stick with ultimately. Um, the rhinos are actually pretty good at self-regulating their, your, their humidity and their hydration. They'll soak in the water bowl if they want to. So perhaps the, the drier cypress mulch isn't, uh, such a bad thing because if they're kept too wet, they can, they can get the skin blistering and, and whatnot. But the hatchlings, I keep them on paper towel and deli cups cause they just eat and poop and, and don't want to be, uh, changing out all that substrate all the time. I want to be able to keep them very clean very easily yeah so let's let's talk a little bit about those hatchlings um so so rhinos are one of the asian rat snakes that i obviously love to death because they're the behaviorally they're the, the anti-rat snake rat snake because they come out and they're essentially a water snake but they're not a water snake they're an arboreal snake and there's a just a lot of really cool biology going on there and i I ended up with a trio. No, I had four of them. I had 2.2, uh, and I moved mine on to Justin Smith. So all those pictures of, of Justin Smith with his rhinos, his precious little children, um, they got their start uh, with, with me. And I really, really enjoyed them. I just – there was something about my room with my Asians that I just had to move them out. I don't know what the hell happened, but it wasn't – they weren't jiving well. Uh, but I did – I just remember thinking, what in the hell – is up with this rat snake that's spending all its damn time in its water bowl. So in your experience, let's just talk a little bit about that semi-aquatic aspect of their care. Um, and you, you mentioned that you were keeping them in, in the racks. Uh, so how do you go about providing them water? Does the water bowl, as you rear them up, get bigger? Do they, they grow out of it, the, the need to be in the water bowl? Just kind of talk about all that part of their biology and their care, because I think that that's one of the things that makes them so interesting and cool. Sure. Yeah. So for the hatchlings, I actually use the, uh, the vivarium or the reptile basics. I, I 10 racks, I think they call them. Mm -hmm. And I use that smallest tub, the I eighties. Mm -hmm. And I have a 3.5 ounce deli cup of water in there. So that cup to me is kind of the perfect size. It's, I mean, it's huge for a hatchling rhino that weighs like two grams. 
and you can put a couple rosy reds in there and um, it's big enough that they can swim around and they can chase the fish, but it's not too big that the fish can easily get away from them. And yeah, the, the water bowl grows as the snake grows. So if I'm put it, putting it into a grow tub, um, I'll scale it up. I'll start using ceramic bowls so they're not flipping them all the time. And then the adults have a water bowl that's about like 12 inches in diameter, so they can still completely submerge in there. So the hatchlings, I would say, pretty consistently all like to soak in the ones that I've observed. But for the older ones, it seems like some of them grow out of it and some of them still continue to do it. Overall, I think the uh, the adults spend less time in the water. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I've, I've seen examples of others where you, you can give them this. Uh, friends of mine that keep in arboreal enclosures, they're still always down in the water bowl. Or even I, I remember... Um, first time I saw rhinos at a zoo was at the Detroit Zoo, and yeah, they had this huge, huge enclosure with all this foliage, and and they're down in the water basin. So mm -hmm. it tends to vary. Gotcha. I think this is a, a kind of a prime example of understanding differences in species, and because mm -hmm. um, again, the green bush rats will do the same thing. And when I first got them, I wasn't accustomed to seeing that so often and so you know, I'm, I'm down here checking for mites yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, oh yeah because you know when, when snakes are constantly in there too you know it's too hot it's not humid enough or there's mites and uh so yeah it's i think that that's a you know, pretty good piece to throw out there for anyone who is interested in rhinos is, is no sure and i remember too when i when I had that first one in my dorm room just sitting there at my desk watching it being fully submerged for for who just yeah. continuously like again i was a new snake uh new snake keeper at that time so i remember getting a little nervous and every now and then i like reach my finger in there and lift its head out of the water like <laughs> you're probably good but i just want to make sure you take one breath for me then go, <laughs> go back do your thing yeah so you you talked about the whole and you've all you, you you've produced rhinos correct you mentioned you have yes. rollbacks i think yeah okay so with this water piece, um, talk a little bit, please, about how you get. So you have a hatchling or a neonate, and it's you know entered the world. It's done its shed. It's ready to eat. What's the process to get these little guys to eat for you? Everybody seems to have similar process, but I've actually heard some different breeders that have like their own little tweak on uh how many fish are in the bowl and the size of the bowl and the depth of the water and all that kind of good stuff. So for someone listening, that's, that's kind of heard about rhinos. How would you get, how, what would you tell them as far as getting the, the things to feed initially? Sure. So I have tried multiple different techniques. I'll go over all of that. Um, but I think the biggest thing to keep in mind for any of them is just do the best to learn to not care at all, whether this thing eats or not, because the more you stress <laughs> out about it and the more you, try a billion different things, the worse you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of just want to pick a method and just wait them out. And over time, the vast majority yeah. will take. So the first year, um, I've produced them the, the past two years in a row. The first year I produced them, I wanted to stay away from fish because of parasite loads and all that. Yeah. Fish could be bad. And so I did all just the tease feeding. Uh, Terry Burwell has done a fantastic video on this technique on his YouTube page. So I recommend looking that up, but it, you essentially hold the snake in one hand at kind of the halfway to back third of its body. And you're either holding the pinky in your fingers or on, ton, on tongs and just kind of dancing it around in front of its face, sometimes touching it on like the, the side of the neck and you want to elicit a strike response. And every now and then that strike response will latch on and hold on, preferably right on the tip of the nose. And then you just freeze, do not move at all uh, and it can take like 15 to 20 minutes per snake or they'll like have the the head almost all the way into their mouth and then you move or you don't move and they just drop it and it's again super frustrating so um that technique can work i ultimately got um all the hatchlings that i produced last year to eat that way but nobody's got that kind of time um again like 15 yeah. to 20 minutes mm -hmm. per animal and and you have like 
uh, around eight in a clutch maybe. Um, so this year I wanted to try just a lot more hands off. I think the risk of parasites being in the fish, I use rosy red feeder fish. It's there the vast majority of the time. It's not going to cause an issue, um, especially yeah. if you're getting your fish from even a remotely trustworthy source. I just get them at one of the, the local big box pet stores. Um, so in that 3.5 ounce deli cup, I'm putting usually two rosies in there and I try to pick the size depending on kind of how big the snake is. I don't want it to be an all out wrestling match with some of those massive rosies you get. So for the first couple of meals, I do just the fish. And then after maybe two to three meals of them taking the fish, I just throw an extra small frozen thawed pinky in there with the two fish. And most of the time they'll take everything. Um, I can't say I have a specific number of feedings that I then do the fish and the pinkies, but eventually I just go down to one fish and then eventually leave the fish out. And right now, all of the remaining hatchlings that I have from last year, um, that's what I'm doing. Just thawing out a pinky, dropping it in the water. I check back in a couple hours and they're all gone. So every so, now and then, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go for it. I was gonna, every now and then there's cool. a rhino that... Um, I, I guess I had one this year that didn't want to, um, eat the fish. And so I went straight for the tease feeding and, um, eventually tried to transition to tease feeding it while it was still in the tub. So I didn't have to hold it and it did pretty well with that. And now it's doing just fine with just drop feeding the pinky right in there. Um, a buddy of mine that's produced the past couple of years as well. I think he starts all of his on live pinks. He doesn't do anything with fish. And the majority of them do fine with live pinks. Cause again, I think oh, cool. the movement is super interesting and enticing to them. And that's one of the things that draws them towards the fish. And if you're using live pinks, if you have access to that regularly, uh, I think they'd do a lot better at eventually transitioning to drop feeding with frozen thawed. So you can skip the fish altogether. Yeah. The, the, the question I was going to ask, which you just alluded to is, so you're putting for the established feeders now, you're putting the pinky into the water dish and they're basically going in there on their own and consuming it. Yeah. Yeah. That's and cool. some, it, it seems like they've caught on to varying degrees. Like I oftentimes catch them in their water dish. And if I dunk the pinky in there on the tongs and kind of get their attention, they'll take it right off the tongs there. Other times I try that and they have no interest. So I just leave it and they come back later, but I have actually noticed a couple of them again, they're in tubs, so it's hard to watch, but, if I set it in there, I can see him coming straight towards the water dish and, and I almost close the tub so I can still barely see them and they peek their head over and they go right in there and they grab pinky and start eating. So it's, they definitely begin to associate or, or mm -hmm. really have a good sense of being able to tell when their food is there and they are almost conditioned to eat that way. That's, that's and so this is just in the water dish too. Like, I mean, right. so, um, meaning like if you lay the pinky on the paper towel somewhere, they show no interest. I haven't tried too much of, uh, laying it outside of the water dish. And the reason why is because I actually kind of want them, these rhinos that are going to end up going to other homes. I want them to be conditioned to this really consistent way of eating. Mm -hmm. We'll get into this more in a little bit, but even well-established baby rhinos, love to make a fool out of you as a breeder when you send them to another home and they suddenly don't want to eat. So yeah, I think if I can get them really well conditioned to, Hey, water is here. That means food is here as well. And then that new owner can eventually transition them to drop feeding elsewhere or feeding off the tongs. I'm hoping that's going to be the best way to set both the rhino and the new owner up for success. Pretty cool. I find that fascinating I, because I mean, as you were discussing that, I'm, I'm thinking it's it's the, the scent, you know what I mean? The scent mm -hmm. of the fish that w is triggering them to go for the pinky. But it, it sounds like, I mean, so you're just throwing it right in their water bowl. No, no fish smell whatsoever. So yeah, that's, that's yeah, I really don't think it's that they've the learned that at all. I, um, I know people that have tried like the fish juices on pinkies or frog juices on pinkies and uh, they showed zero interest in that. But I've heard of people trying like dark frog tadpoles and they go crazy for them. So I, I really think it is the movement. And over time, once they kind of mesh that 
that trigger of the movement of the prey item with the presence of the pinky or the smell of the pinky or something like that, um, the lines become blurred for them and eventually you're able to get rid of the movement and just have the pinky and they still take it. Very, very cool. Yeah, when very when neat. I had them, I, I know what you're talking about, the, the making the fool of the breeder because... Now, now, the guys that I, I got mine off of did say they're probably going to go off of food and it's going to take a little while before they eat. And it did take a little sure. while for them to eat. <laughs> but they That's were valid eating. advice for any yes. new rhino owner. Just <laughs> expect that could happen. But they, they ate. Um, I was dropped. What I was doing, I do this with a lot of my snakes, is um, I always put the water bowls in the front of if they're in a tub or even if they're in a, not necessarily a tub in a rack, but like a Rubbermaid freestanding tub that is like a quarantine because that's what I normally use. Um, I always put the water bowls on the front of the cage so that or the tub so that I can like through that opaqueness kind of see if somebody's in there with the rhinos. It did work well because they were in there. But I would just kind of prop the fuzzy. Mine were at the point where they were eating fuzzies up so that I could just kind of glance from afar at the tub and see if the fuzzy was there. And I looked at fuzzies next to the water bowls for like a month and a half before they ate anything. <laughs> it was like, Jesus, these things just want to die. And then sure enough, bam, that switch got flipped and then they were off to the races and ate like champs. So, yeah. And that's kind of going back to what I was saying earlier. Like yeah. the more you can learn to not care if they eat or not, mm -hmm. the better off you're going to be because it is so common, especially when they move to a new home that they go off food. Uh, they could be eating super consistently for the breeder. Then you get them and I mean, it's a huge change of environment. So many different variables have changed. Mm -hmm. And they can go a surprisingly long time without eating and be totally fine. But all these different things, the new owners get nervous and they try all these different techniques mm -hmm. that's just going to stress them out more. That's going to make them uh, burn through their, their energy stores faster. And what if you just give them time, be patient with them, help them feel secure? They almost always eventually come around. So in that scenario, it do you recommend that that keepers just be consistent with the pinkies, or is it a you want to get some food in them and just kind of elicit the response so you start over again and do the the rosies, assuming that you're dealing with a small snake? I'm I'm, I'm sure if you have an adult, you're not necessarily going to be doing um, rosy reds, but those juveniles, right. classic deli cup size individual, you pick up um, to start your pair trio or individual pet whatever you do uh, what would you recommend if you you've got the snake now it's going on the hunger strike how do you break the hunger strike sure so first thing i would say is figure out what your breeder was doing consistently and, mm -hmm. and also how they started them because if they were just used to live pinks and then you throw some fish in there um, they might have no response to that but when i send uh, a rhino to a new home i only do it once they have gotten off the fish and they've just been eating the rosies, but I let the new owners know for the first couple meals, you might need to put some fish back in there that will help them get used to these triggers and cues that they're familiar with of where to find the food and that the movement of the fish, it'll help them get used to that in your new environment. Um, so yeah, I usually recommend going back to fish. Uh, I guess they could try just the pinky first and sometimes they've had luck with that. I've had uh, some also that I, never even fed them pinkies off the tongs and the new owners try it out and they eat off the tongs and have continued to do so. There you go. so yeah. PJ, we, we talked about how you keep your adults where we talked about stubborn babies and how to get them to feed, but let's talk about in the middle there. Yeah. From how do you go from adults to having babies? You know, you walk me through <laughs> that process, you know, kind of thing. How, how do you breed them? How do you keep them? Do you brumate them? Sure. You know, what's yeah. that look like? Yeah, so I do roommate. Uh, I do roommate them. Um, I'm just working out of one room for everything, so I had to figure out kind of a creative way to uh, get my adults cooled down while keeping all the the non adults and everything that's growing still warm and eating. So there's one window in this room, and all of the animals that are going to roommate, I just moved them all into one rack slid that against the window and then went to the uh, Home Depot and got some of that two inch rigid foam board and essentially just yeah, constructed yeah, yeah. a foam cabinet around the window and that rack and then opened that window a couple inches. Inside that cabinet, it stays like 
55 to 60 degrees and outside in the room it's 70 to 75 so it works out perfectly so i brew mate for uh three three and a half months or so october 1st is always when i stop feeding and i give my adults a good um four to six weeks to clear out before i start cooling them down um, i know i've heard people say two weeks sometimes I, I feel like that's a little bit too short and i don't want to end up cooling something down and putting it into brumation when there's uh, still food in the gut so it's usually around mid-november where i start cooling things down and, and first that's just moving them towards the window and then constructing the cabinet and closing that and then eventually opening the window and february 1st is going to be when i start to slow them or start to warm them back up so uh, that'll be gradual again i'll close the window give them a few days and then open the cabinet doors and let them start to acclimate to the room air and then my technique for breeding the rhinos is actually i have pretty much the same technique for all of the um all the clubbers that i keep i just kind of keep things on a cycle i like to get at least one or two meals in them before i start pairing but then i'm usually feeding on sundays i give them till wednesday to digest i pair them on wednesdays and i leave them till saturday take them apart again feed on sunday let them digest till wednesday and i just keep that going uh until <laughs> i i start to see gravid females um i do palpate a lot of my females as well so that it lets me kind of track if if eggs are growing in there and um, eventually once it seems that the girls have had have had enough and they're obviously gravid i might stop pairing the male but sometimes i even still just keep that rotation uh you know just just in case they need one more lock to actually get fertilized eggs yeah so i have a question about this because this is an area where i think i screwed up last year and i'm trying something different um so you mentioned that you 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 keep them and you palpate do you keep them together until you palpate a follicle uh, or, or is there like a magic cutoff point where they've been together X number of months and it's just not going to happen? Uh, but like, what is the duration of from, all right, first pairing, you just go, go, go. At what point do you say, okay, you know, this is done. You go to your tank, you go to your tank until next year. Well, I guess I've just been uh, blessed with so much success <laughs> that I haven't had to uh, reach that failure point yet. And I'm going to knock on some wood behind me real quick. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, only breeding uh, rhinos for two years. Um, I have two females that have gone two years in a row. So either the technique really works or yeah, I've just been, I'm sure I've just been getting lucky so far. Um, but really, I I guess I would just keep going until it's getting towards the end of the season, September or so, I would say my rhinos are normally laying in May or June, maybe July if they're going really late. Um, but I don't know other people that are getting rhino clutches in November uh, coming really late. Mm -hmm. So I guess if it's getting towards brumation time towards October and I still haven't seen anything happen, I'm not palpating and feeling any follicles. Yeah, I'll, I'll give up then, but it's a, uh, simple enough to manage again just feeding and pairing that there's really no point in discontinuing trying in my opinion pj can you remind me what area of the country you're in i'm in southwest michigan near the kalamazoo area i uh, just kind of because we were talking about that large variance on when you're, you're getting eggs and when some others are just sometimes i wonder if that's due to location because uh, even if we're trying to keep things the same temps as we've discussed before, and um, I, I've heard it on the podcast as well. I mean, we talk barometric pressure when we talk about mm -hmm. different uh, uh, different things like that. So just just curious, because uh, and I'm glad you jumped into it. It's one of the questions I was. My next question was going to be, when do you get eggs? You know, are they early mm -hmm. breeders, late breeders? And uh, but it sounds like they could kind of be either. Yep, in in my experience, they tend to be on the early side. Um, the person that uh i mentioned is always seeming to get the late clutch is actually andy vick is the one zach that oh, I think andy. You got some years from yeah and he's that's in, who i got uh, mine from he's in ohio <laughs> so not too far off from uh the yeah, climate so I'm should in, be similar. Yeah. i think he's uh he's got a really hot room as well with a lot of the other stuff that he keeps and so it's almost like his uh 
his climate, his herps think his climate is flipped or something. Mm -hmm. no, but yeah, right. yeah, temperature and region, I'm sure are going to add a lot of variation in there. Gotcha. So, uh, so they bred. What's the the gravidity look like in these animals? Is it obvious when a female? Is gravid? Do they do the classic, you know, prelay shed? How long to eggs after the prelay shed? All that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So, well, I definitely don't have all my records in front of me, so That's I can't cool. give you all the nerdy numbers. But <laughs> being that they are such a slender-bodied snake, as long as you're keeping them at a good body condition and not not letting them get too obese, it's going to be very obvious when there are eggs in there. In fact, uh, having that kind of classic Ganyosoma like squared off belly. Mm -hmm. If you hold them up, you can you can oh, visually yeah, cool. see when the eggs are big enough. You can okay. see all those those curves. Um, and yeah, they do a uh, prelay shed. Uh, rhinos seem to be one of those snakes that when they start to go blue, it just takes forever until they shed. Um, once they have shed, I know I've got it written down. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it is like a consistent to the day from when they shed to when they lay. So I, I always, when I'm a couple days from out from that, like two or three days, I actually take the water bowl out. Um, yeah. and I'll just hydrate them if I feel they need it just by misting directly onto them and they'll drink some of the water droplets from the mist and they've got their human hide box. So they're by no means going to dehydrate, but I take the water bowl out because I've heard too many horror stories of mm -hmm. rhinos, especially laying eggs in the water. They all drown. Better luck next year. Yeah, I do the same thing with the tallest water cobras, that giant water bin it leaves and they get this little cup. And they kind of look at me like, what the hell, man? I'm like, there's no way. Because I love you to death and you're pretty smart, but you're dumb enough to lay those eggs in that water bowl and that's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. So how do uh how do you incubate them? What kind of temper you put them on? Uh I have my incubator set at 77, 78 degrees. Um, so pretty pretty low and slow. And they take about uh seventy three days, I think is pretty consistently been about what it's at at that temp. And I've used a variety of substrates. Um, last the, or the first year, I was using um, oh, what's the one with? It's like the perlite with the water isomer in it, where you don't have to measure. Um, uh, hatch right. Hatch right. That's it. That's yep. That's right. Yeah. That works well, and I put them right in, um, right in the substrate. This past year, I've been using a lot more vermiculite. I just got a bulk bag of it. But uh, even when I really squeeze all the water out, out of that, I feel like the vermiculite has been a little too wet for me. So um, I get some of that light diffuser panel and put that on mm -hmm. top. So it's a little bit more of a yeah. suspended yeah. incubation. And I've tried separating the eggs. Um, I've tried leaving them all as a bundle and they've always seemed to do pretty well. You definitely don't want to get them too wet though. Um, I, I did have a couple eggs that I think uh, took on a bit too much moisture and, and drowned or something like that. So uh, that's why I've been doing the suspended incubation and it works. Very cool. Nice. Very, very cool. All right. And then they hatch. What are you keeping these things in? You mentioned the racks, but just kind of go through the the process of now I have a baby rhino. Is it immediately going into a rack tub? Is it going into another tub? Uh, keep it in a deli cup for a little while. Like, what's the process from I've hatched out of the egg to getting it established? Yep, mine immediately go into the racks um, individually. And again, these are about as small of a rack tub as I've ever seen. They're the Reptile Basics I-80s. It's like a pencil case. Oh, we so, have those. I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. They are very small. Yeah, I think I think Matt absolutely hates those racks. I've he does. I've loved them. They've been <laughs> fantastic for me. Um and yeah, again, paper towel substrate and a 3.5 ounce deli cup in there. The tub is small enough that they one, I don't know of any hides that would really fit in there. And two, it's small enough and dark enough that I don't think they really would benefit much more from hide. Some of them will crawl under the paper towel if they really want a hiding spot. But again, I don't want it to be too big because I want them to feel secure. 
and I want them to be fairly close to that deli cup so that when I put fish in there, they can obviously notice the movement and be enticed to eat. Fair enough. And then they're in that size tub for how long before they move on to the next? If yeah, you have a so, good, good eater, because I know we got variation in between the good eaters and the non-eaters. So, Right. It's going to be, uh, well, I guess the next size tub up from that in that same rack, you can fit the I-160 tubs, which is essentially like a double wide. So you could put them into that one within six months to a year. Um, okay. Once they, again, I, I've had some at that size that have been growing well and they're doing fine and I move them into that bigger tub and it they get a little sketchy on feeding. So I put them back into the small one and that fixes it. So some just really like the small secure spaces. So they could stay in that size till they're about um, a year to 18 months. It really depends on the growth size because of the next tub size that I have, they could probably certainly handle a larger tub because uh, I'd say about the one year mark is when you're going to be able to more consistently get them feeding off the tongs if that's what you want to do and they get a little bit more bold and bulletproof. Um, but mm -hmm. the next tub size I have is the Vibrarium Electronics, uh, again, the Reptile Basics Rack, the VE6s. So it's like yes. about an eight core tub and they do have a little bit of a gap in there. So of yes, course, to the holdback females <laughs> that I kept from, mm -hmm. from last year or from 2021, when they were a little over a year old, I moved them into these eight quart tubs in the bigger rack and uh, went checking on everybody and one of them was gone. And I mean that, I don't know, you could barely exactly fit like a, a small stack of paper through there, but they squeezed their way through. And uh, luckily I found her, it only took like 10 minutes of searching, you know, just like. Felt like an attorney there, there, didn't it? Oh, it does, yeah. yeah. And your stomach <laughs> drops and I went and got my wife oh. and I'm like, I need your help. We need to tear this room apart. But <laughs> yeah, the trick is if, if anyone ever loses a snake in the rack and it's your first time, start close to the tub and just start pulling yeah. the tubs out. And it's almost always fairly nearby, um, like back on the heat tape. Yeah. But we got her. It was good. She went back into the smaller tub. She got grounded for a little <laughs> while until she got a little bit more mm -hmm. size on her. And yeah, the, those holdbacks are about 18 months now and they're plenty big to not squeeze out. Nice, nice, nice. And then you said currently you're keeping adults in racks. So just talk a little bit about that size. And then talk about your plans, if you don't mind, when you get the vivariums, what's your setup going to be in your mind's eye? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the adults are currently in about a 28-quart a tub. Um, I would offer them larger, like a, a 32 to 35 if I had that size rack. But being that I have just the reptile basics racks, it's basically a 28 quart or CB70. Yep. And um, they would probably do fine in a CB70. But again, I mentioned I've got Taiwan beauties, Mollendorfs, yes. and <laughs> Russians and black milk. So I, I need mm -hmm. that limited real estate for that. So uh, for the cages I'm looking at, of course, my, my THP guys have uh, talked me in some black box cages. Yep. And um, I'm not totally sure if I'm going to go for um, like 18 by 18, 24s or like a two foot cube, um, something like that. And it would be uh, just one um, one snake per cage. Uh, the idea of having a bigger cage and kind of co-having them more consistently sounds very appealing. Um, I'd be a little nervous to do so because I, believe it or not, have heard two different stories of rhinos cannibalizing. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was a, a breeder female that was like oh, halfway God. through <laughs> eating, halfway through eating the male. The other, um, I'll, I'll stay vague just to try to protect some uh, yeah, reputations out there. But this person uh, was, for some reason, they felt, despite advice, it was going to be a good idea to put their rhino in with some Baron's racers because they look similar. Oh, the no. rhino ate a Baron's racer. Really? Yes. So that's really funny because one of the things <clears throat> that I wasn't going to go here, but you, you brought us here, <laughs> is that there's this fun debate in one of the chats I'm in, and Justin Smith's in it, it's the THP chat, about what is a superior unicorn snake. And I am yeah. 
I am firmly on Team Bear and I, but I might have to like bow down to the rhinos now because if a freaking rhino ate a Baron's racer, it, that like we're done. <laughs> like that's yeah. I I would have thought I would have it was going to be the rhino eating the rhino. Yeah. <laughs> so no, very unfortunately, crazy. the uh, the rhino uh, took the belt on that one. Oh man, I have to. Yikes. Smith's gonna listen to this, and it's gonna. That chops my ass a little bit. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry about that. But anyways, yeah. So my arboreal cages will be uh, one rhino per cage, except for gotcha. one pairing to breed, obviously. Um, that, yeah, a cohab setup might work well, might look awesome, especially uh, like your Prezinum, yeah. you said, um, mm -hmm. are in that 1.3. That I bet that's fantastic. Um, so just like uh, one of the things that I like about rat keeping and why I – really use it quite a bit is I like to be able to keep things super clean, super easily. Um, bioactives are great. Yes, they clean themselves, but really probably not as much as some people think they do, especially for snakes when they have such large amounts of waste product. So I'd rather be able to do full substrate changes and easily disinfect everything. Um, so my arboreal cages are going to be pretty simplistic as well. I'll still just have like Reptichip or Mm -hmm. or um, cypress mulch in the bottom, and I'll put some perching in there and have the same water bowls that I'm using now, nice large water bowls they can soak in, uh, essentially just giving them more climbing space and, and more display. Um, I've done some bioactives for like geckos and things, and it's fun. I definitely don't have the green thumb to really make like a true masterpiece <laughs> and, and keep plants alive, so I'll, I'll stick to my uh, success where it, where it actually is. Fair. Totally fair. Yeah, on the, the subject of bioactive and large snakes, uh, I, I'm, you know, when I teach the herpetoculture class, we have big lab period on bioactivity. And I don't, and, and, and it, it's definitely the buzzword right now, as you know, I keep it bioactive. But even the guy, um, uh, the, the Courtney Smith guy who wrote the book on bioactivity, he was on the um, Animals at Home podcast saying, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with naturalistic keeping, which is just simply get, taking the poo out and getting not right. dealing with the nutrient. You still get the behavioral response. Um, the animals are still doing their thing, uh, but you kind of get more sterility there. And I've, I have a couple, at, at, well, Barron's racers. I keep a couple of those at my house. Um, and I was just for the hell of it trying to do the bioactive thing and i thought they're big enough but the piles of poo are not large like a false water cobra or a king or you know even a big rat snake it, it could go and and i still ended up in the end bot cleaning uh because it, it it just took the the crap forever to turn into nothing um so yeah. there is like a, a, a there's a magic turd size where this works and when you go above the turd threshold, magic turd size. Every, yeah, well, then, and we're also talking about the turd threshold. When you get above that, and and it's not, you know, you better have a million springtails and an army of isos if you're really yeah. going to get, you know, get the job done. There is a a, a um a, a a person in um I don't remember the country, but her name is Anki, and she created. It's well worth looking up if you're in the False Water Facebook group look this enclosure up but she made a nine it's like a nine foot long by five foot deep by eight foot tall bioactive enclosure and she just has so much substrate that she can go in with a little hand rake and rake the the poo into the the substrate and that's going to work but just think about the volume of what you're dealing with there versus a four by two by two it's just not you know so anyway yeah so and all that to say my my keeping style versus yeah the full bioactive like I am in full support of bioactive. People create mm -hmm. some incredibly beautiful oh, uh, enclosures yeah. that take fantastic care of their animals. But like you were saying, I'd still recommend uh, just pick the poop out of there if you see it. Because, um, yeah, the isopods and the springtails, they'll still, they're, still do their job. They'll still get some of that nutrients out of there. But you're just helping their success and, and keeping those harmful yeah. contaminants out of your animal's environment. 100%. So... Anything else? We, we kind of covered everything. I'm looking at the outline there. Any other just quirks of rhinos that's, that, that that make it so you like to keep them? That that I mean, you obviously have the Molendorfs and the Russians, and 
Taiwan beauties. So you have a, a, a diversity of Asian rats, and it seems like you're kind of leaning towards the big guys versus the by Max Dion's, you know, mm -hmm. smaller ones. Um, what is it about them that 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 you just like compared to the other guys? What is it about the bigger guys or the uh, the rhinos? We, yeah, we could do the bigger guys and then rhinos specifically. That's actually kind of a cool question. Yeah, well, <laughs> I guess for every one of the bigger guy species, um, I have a story about how that species kind of like fell into my lap. And yeah, I was interested <laughs> in them. There um, you go. But so the original pair of Russians that I had, as well as the black milks, um, a good buddy of mine, Sam, he was moving out to California and he had this uh, fantastic collection, which included those, the Russians, and the black milks, and he couldn't take everything with him. Um, so uh, I ended up procuring those animals from him and and i've absolutely loved them i fell in, in love with the russians especially and they've done fantastic for me um this same buddy of mine he gave me one of his taiwan beauty hatchlings that he produced and i grew that thing up again i just loved the the massive and and really quite tame uh giant colubrid and i ended up getting a male for her and the molendorfs uh Another buddy of mine who's more of a gecko guy, he had them, um, um, and he tried his hand at breeding them and just had no success, so he kind of passed them off to me, like, here, give them a try. If they breed, great. If they die, just let me know. Good luck. <laughs> and uh, I did. Again, I, I treat my Molendorfs with that same kind of rumation and breeding cycle and feeding cycle that I mentioned for the rhinos, and they've produced the past two years for me, so... Um, Maybe Southwest Michigan is just the ideal yeah. climate for old world colubrids, um, but it works. So yeah, I, I love all those uh, those spe those larger species. They did really just kind of fall into my lap, but I guess it was kind of fateful um, because I mm -hmm. do enjoy them so much. And I think the first time that I really realized that was when I was at my buddy Sam's place and he had this just massive Taiwan beauty female that was eating like medium rats. So huge girth. Yep. And, and it's one thing to hold like a large Python or a large boa. Um, but the body tone of a colubrid is just so much different. And the way they move in your hands is so much different. Um, can't really even put words into why that was mm -hmm. so appealing, but if you know, you know, um, so yeah. Very cool to have these, yeah, these large muscular snakes that have all these exciting colors and sure. personalities. And, and there's a reason they call them beauty them. snakes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so there's a reason they call them beauty snakes, mm -hmm. you know, you, especially when you get one of these big ones. I mean, they're they're phenomenal. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so then the rhino specifically, compared to everybody else, is it the yeah. colors and the schnoz or? Yeah, I mean, the, the horn is the most unique thing. Like, you know, you, yep. let's see, it was like early 2010s, and I'm, I'm watching all the Snake Bites TV, and yeah, there's all this mm -hmm. cool stuff, but then there's this thing with the horn on its nose, and um, you don't forget that. And uh, yeah. and the green as well, the green-blue, like, that's just uh, super unique on any other snake. And again, going back to when it's in your hands, it's totally different. Like, even those other colubrids, the larger ones I was just talking about, Holding a rhino is even different still. Um, like you are the tree when you're holding them. And I love mm -hmm. showing people like how long their tail is and like wrapping just the tail around a couple of my fingers and letting that whole snake dangle and showing how it like just climbs right back up itself and, and how much body control it has. And um, they love to do that like little head bob thing too. Mm -hmm. when they're really reaching out and bobbing their head side to side. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just right. very interesting to hold. Very, very cool. Okay, so let's. You kind of talked about how you got your black milks. Mm -hmm. So, have, have you produced the black milks, or do you? Yes, I've produced yes. them every year since 2019. Oh. Holy crap! Okay. Yeah. So, um, just a little like, how big are you? Are are, are yours? Because uh, to kind of give the the people listening, in case you don't know, um, there's a little bit of debate. And the taxonomy of these things has just gone to absolute hell. Uh, but the the kind of classic herpetoculture name that we use is Lampropeltis triangulum gage. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they're Lampropeltis microfolis now. 
Yeah, technically. I, I thought I saw that as well, but then yes. again, I tried looking up their Latin yeah. name when I was filling out a shipping box, and I couldn't find anything <laughs> about Microfolus. And that's isn't isn't there yeah. another species that's under Microfolus? Uh, there, there's someone's gonna gut me on this one. It's Lampropeltis Microfolus, and then I think it's Lampropeltis ab abnorma or abnormum, and um, it's basically the tropical milk snake now. In, okay. in the most modern taxonomy, kind of glumps. Um, I think Andeans and black milks and a couple others are all now one species. And then Hondur Hondurans are the other one. But I might have that backwards. So this is one of the one of the times I'm definitely going to say, don't trust me. Look it up on your own and make sure I'm right. If you're like, what is, what is he saying? But I know it used to be Gage. And I also know in the trade... That there's, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, the black milks are famous or infamous for their size. Uh, I've, I've heard one person refer to them once as the poor man's indigo. Uh, and there's yeah, this idea really. that they get to be huge. And they certainly do get to be huge. But there's also a couple lines out there that get to be large, but I wouldn't necessarily say huge. Um, so do you know anything about the background of your animals? particularly or no yeah i know people talk milks. about yeah, the other san antonio zoo line the denver mm -hmm. zoo line i uh, yeah. mine are black milk snakes and they're cool there you go. that's <laughs> what i know <laughs> that's perfect so how big are yours michigan locale right michigan yep. locale yep. Yeah, southwest michigan okay. <laughs> <laughs> how big are your animals let's see my male is now actually a little bit bigger than I, uh, my female um I've never taken a seamstress tape down the back, but I <laughs> gauge him right around five and a half. Saying nice. six feet sounds a little bit too big, but five and a half feet. I mean, I'm about six feet tall. If I pulled him by the tail, he's stretching almost all the way down to the ground. Very cool. And yeah, female probably closer to four and a half to five feet range. Okay. And are yours um, the solid black at this point? Yes. Or yep. still showing some pattern? No, they're yeah, they're solid black. I think they're like 2016 animals, so very much adults. Yeah. Okay. So one of the locales that's in herpetoculture is Limon, or yeah. Limon, Costa mm -hmm. Rica. And mm -hmm. uh, just a real quick, fun little nerdy story. Um, the first time I took kids to Costa Rica was March of 2020, and I want us all to think about what happened in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. So I got <laughs> yes, that's correct. I got 20 people out of Costa Rica 48 hours before they closed it down. Um, but within five hours of us landing, a kid stepped off of a spiral staircase into air and landed on his ankle and completely busted the ligament in his ankle. And he didn't break mm -hmm. his ankle, but he essentially broke his ankle. And we were on a barrier island. Uh, we, we drove the next day to a barrier island um, where you had to take a Jeep and get on a boat and then take a half hour boat ride to get to this island. And uh, he, we got him there and then he informed us that he had hurt his foot. And so then we had to take a boat to a Jeep, got to the hospital uh, to deal with it. When we got there, he informed us that his passport was back at camp. So then I got to take a Jeep, take a boat, take a boat, take a Jeep. It was like the most ridiculous scenario. Wow. But we inevitably ended up having to go to this city named Limon. And we're driving there, and, and in the back of my head, I'm like, I know this place. How do I know this place? And I thought, like, I knew it for something else, and we're, like, driving, and then it just all hit me at once. Black milk snakes! That's what this place is known for. So there you go. You know, uh, and I can say that the hospital in Limon is uh, it's special. There's razor wire and people walking around with um, assault rifles, and it's oh, pretty wow. awesome, actually. <laughs> so... Yeah, so I got to be in the habitat, at least, for the snakes. But um, I know they also come from uh, a couple other localities. But with, with yours, so, you know, what's your basic setup for them? Um, you mentioned them keeping them cool, and that's kind of a classic aspect of their husbandry. Uh, so, yeah, just kind of walk yeah. us through that, because we haven't talked about so, the species yet on the podcast. Sure. So, again, I, I keep it simple. Mine are in CB70s. Um, they've been on Reptichip. They're on Cypress Mulch now large water dish. Um, they'll do a little bit of burrowing in the substrate on their own. So I don't even offer hide boxes and they don't seem to bother that one bit. They're definitely really bold and uh, they don't really have a, a, a fear response. Um, 
So I keep a 77 degree hotspot on my thermostat for the female. Um, I don't keep any heat on any of my males for these species that we've talked about actually, except the hognose. Um, and that's just to, that's the breeding male. It's just to keep, uh, lower the risk of accidentally overheating their sperm and, and killing the sperm. Mm -hmm. And they do great that way. And again, just like all the other species, I follow that same rumation and, and feeding and rotating for breeding. And, uh, yeah, again, every year since 2019, um, they've produced for me, I've had a hundred percent, um, fertilization every time I've never had a black milk snake infertile egg laid. Oddly enough, I have had, I think four different eggs over, um, four eggs total over the course of three years that have popped during over position while she was laying them. And I just find like Whoa. this shriveled <laughs> shrunken water balloon. And then there's nasty albumin and, and yolk all over the rest of the eggs I get to clean up. Uh, interestingly enough, even with that, um, the, the rest of the good eggs have never molded either and always hatched hundred percent success. So they're hardy, but yeah, I would like to find out why these eggs are popping. Cause I could save a couple babies every year. That is crazy. Do you find that do yours go late? No, they're late pretty mid season. Um, let's see. Babies are usually hatching uh mid september so that means they're they're laying like sometime in july i incubate them wow. around 77 to 78 degrees and they're going um no no they might be laying a little bit earlier than that because these things go for like 80 ish days at 77 degrees nice. Whoa, cool. yeah, mine tend to go a lot later i'm i remember i've hatched them in november okay <laughs> Yeah, early to mid September is usually when mine are hatching. Kind of got them on the same schedule as my subox. That's what I'm expecting them real late. Chipping <laughs> mm -hmm. those the next year, you know, kind of thing. Well, hey, yeah. you're you're full time now, so you can uh, stay busy with hatching this year round. <laughs> hey, there you Touché. go. Mm -hmm. Do you do anything? So you have them too, Clint. The black milk. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. So how many um, do you have? Uh, I think what's now, your ratios? The, I think I've got a 2.3 uh, at the moment. Um, lost one of my adult males uh, this past year. Probably the stress of the move and uh, mm -hmm. the new room that we had in was warmer than what I wanted it to be. But uh, yeah, and actually everything that PJ just said, that's the same way I Bought keep on it. What I you do? Thing, yeah, I think the only thing I do different is uh, I do have a, a humid hide in there but i have that in everything's cage yeah um but uh yes i've got him a cb70 on cyprus wow um, identical <laughs> yeah i mean yeah at my hot spots probably 77 if if i've even got it um so yeah and, and this was the first year that i missed on producing them uh really? but again i i kind of I blame the transition. I mean, that's, that go. was a, uh, not only the move, but you know, my attention was certainly not as on them <laughs> as, uh, it had been in previous years, but, but anyway, beforehand, like I said, mine were always much later, you know, I just kind of learned to accept that they were going to be like the sub ox and I uh, just tend to be late. So I'm curious. Now, it's interesting to find that yours are you know more on the, the early to mid schedule. Yeah, that's that's you brewmate. You you yeah, we didn't ask that. Yeah, yeah the too. same. All of my, um, all of my adults, I, I brewmate them the same way I mentioned earlier. Gotcha. Yeah. Same. Okay. So then, what do you, what do you do about feeding? Because these are pretty big snakes, but lamp yeah. historically have, they don't seem to have the 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 ability to take down a prey item like a rat snake, like rat snakes will just slurp down something that's huge. Um, but that may not necessarily be the case with black milks. Um, my experience with black milks is just raising the, we have like a treat. We, we had 2.2 here and I thought we had 2.2 and then I went to, they finally got old enough to breed. And then I found out that we had, um, it was a good ratio. We had, we had four females. We didn't have a male. Oh, like, wow. Huh. So, Anywho, 
but uh, feeding frequency and what are you feeding them? Yeah, so I like to um, offer a good variety. And even for my big rat snakes, I'm not trying to fit the biggest meal I can get in there. Mm -hmm. um, on occasion, I've gotten what are dubbed as small rats, but those are still actually pretty massive. I prefer to do weaned rats, jumbo mice, or chicks. Um, the majority is probably the rats with the mice being in second for frequency and then the chicks on occasion. This next year, I'm going to try to do um, a little bit more of a regular rotation on that and even throwing in some some jumbo frozen thawed frog, leg, frog legs, mm -hmm. see if anybody's interested in those. But uh, yeah, with those sizes, they they do just fine with that. They can still handle a pretty big meal. And for frequency, um, again, I'm usually just feeding once a week. Um, oftentimes, I'll feed the males one feeder item and the females two feeder items. Or um, if it seems like they're, you know, there's that balance between like, are you getting gravid or just fat? And if yeah. I start to notice that, I'll um, back it off to just one feeder item for the girls or smaller meals um, or maybe do, yeah, the smaller meals, but space it out rather than both together. I'll do one on Sunday and one midweek. Interesting. Uh, I found that my black milks, that was one that was about 50, 50 on chicks for me because I do something very similar and try to get chicks mixed in uh, quite a bit. I, I think there's a lot of these specifically rat snakes uh, since you mentioned them that, I think their natural diet has a lot more poultry in it than mm -hmm. yeah. the mammal, you know, and For sure. uh, that more. Uh, so, yeah, so same thing. I, I try to get that mixed in, but the, I'm about 50, 50 on the black milks on who will take it. Yeah. Chicken. And I mean, that makes sense. They're more of a, they're more of a terrestrial species than some of these rat snakes being up in the trees and mm -hmm. hunting birds and nests. So, but it, I will be interested to see what they think of the amphibian when I offer that this year. Uh, be interested to hear that as well. Uh, yeah, haven't offered that. Anytime frog legs are in this house, I'm eating them. Oh, nice. There you go. <laughs> nice. And there's the hillbilly coming out. For yeah, there you go. Listen, hey man, I'm from West by God. I understand yeah. hillbilly better than anyone. <laughs> I am who I sound like, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. All right. Cool. So then, um, any issues? Uh, with lamp propellants, I always love to ask this question because if you go on the message boards or your Facebook groups or whatever, it seems like there's two very different schools of thought with people that work with lamps. And, and, and there's the hyper conservative, oh, these things are ophiophagous, they're going to eat each other. You know, I'm going to sit there and watch them when I put them together and limit the amount of interaction. And then there's like the other side of the fence where they're like, I just open the tub and throw the mail in there and Nine times out of ten, everything goes well. So, kind of say what you do, and then explain why you do. What yeah, you do. I've. They have never shown any behavior that would make me slightly nervous. And again, these are the only lamp propellants I've ever worked with personally. Um, I've heard a lot about the ones you're talking about, um, but black milk snakes—they're like the gentle giants of, or at least they seem to be compared to the. Uh, what a lot of people talk about with these other king snakes and milk snakes. Mm -hmm. um, I've never even had them. I think I had one baby bite me once, but I've never had a black milk snake try to get aggressive or defensive with me at all. So I put them together. I don't even worry about it. And with the babies as well, um, when they hatch, I actually keep all the babies together until they shed out. You can obviously see once those reds are brighter, they've shed and I, I yeah. separate them out after that. Are you I that same that. camp, Clint? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I've never had, uh, you know, until you just said it, I didn't even think about it. But no, I've never had a black milk even strike at me or pretend to. But uh, as far as the adults, no, I throw them together uh, with no concern whatsoever. Yeah, and uh, with that topic, I want to take an opportunity to get on a a black snake soapbox real quick and say that I have <laughs> no idea how Mexican black kings got so popular. Like, yes, they're cool. Yes. They're, they're due. But nobody was talking about black milk snakes. And maybe it's it's the patience for the color change or people not seeing those babies and realizing what they become. But in my book, how can it get better than, yes, no, it it's doesn't. an all black snake. 
and it's bigger and it's not trying to eat you all the time or eat your other snakes. Mm -hmm. So you, you're sparking a story that I want to tell real quick. <laughs> Let's hear it. As far as why Mexican black uh, Kings are so popular, I can, th that's going to be a whole other piece that I I've got opinions on as well. Uh, positive on how that actually happened. However, so when I, this is how I got my black milks in the first place, when Mexican black Kings were peaking, because while they the, the, like the price point is, is still much higher than what it was years ago, um, I think we're past the hump. Yes. You know, it's, it's a little lower now than what it was two years ago. Um, but as they were peaking, um, I knew, I knew Mexican, I'm sorry, black milks were going to be on the rise. That not <laughs> enough people had thought about them yet, but that was mm -hmm. going to be another hot piece. Um, and and I, I've wanted to work with them anyway. I mean, so for those listening, it's not all about the money. It's not where I'm going, but it was it was on my radar to say the least. And I was uh, I was at Tinley, and this was gosh, I want to say it had to be 20, 2018, maybe. Um, and I, uh, I I walked past the table, and. There they were, you know, there's a bunch of Mexican, I'm sorry, a bunch of uh, black milks and the price point on them. I, I knew that there were, I was never going to find a better price than these. Do you remember <laughs> what they were? They 125 bucks. Oh, holy man. crap. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. $125. You are so, correct. Uh, <laughs> and, and so here's, so I bought 2.2 right there. I walked mm -hmm. back to my table, uh, talked with my buddy, and I'm like, you know, I'm stupid to not go get the rest of these, you know, at this price. Mm -hmm. Walked back over, they were gone. Sold out. He, he still had like at least seven of them sitting there when I walked off, and they were gone in just that uh, that fast. Very next year, they were over three hundred dollars. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. even by the same same guy. Um, so, and I forget his name. He's well known for Hondurans. I mean, if I said his name, I know you guys would know him. Uh, but Black Milks, Hondurans, um, gosh, I wish I could. Uh, I'll think about it as soon as this podcast ends. But, <laughs> um, but I just, I, I knew that that was going to be a species that, even though it may not get the same popularity as Mexican Black Kings, because it, it is bigger. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's not as commonly found, but uh, I knew that that was going to be one that was going to spark interest because if you like a, a jet black snake, there's going to be a segment of the population that wants a bigger jet black jet snake, black snake, you know, yeah. with the same kind of care. So um, that's, that's how I grabbed yeah. mine was because of how popular Mexican black Kings were. And I wanted something a little bigger, a little better in my mind. And I had a feeling that it was going to shoot, and it did. You know, the price yeah. is well. Um, I mean, it's even above that three hundred mark now. So it is. Yeah, you, you you can't beat that ontogenic color change. I mean, they really? come out a oh, tricolor, true. and they end depending on the the line you get. Because there are the there is the one line where they they got like the very weak banding that if the light is yeah. hitting them the right way, you can see them. But you can also get that jet black onyx look, which is pretty freaking yeah. cool. Yeah. No. Yep, and I yeah, also and the color, think, go for it. <laughs> the color change is pretty interesting too. On mm -hmm. even within the same clutch, um, a buddy of mine took two females from me, and one of them turned almost all black very quickly, and the other it lost the the yellowish white banding, but it held on to its red banding for a long red, time. Yeah, yeah. Clutch mate, that's yeah. very cool. Well, that's too. what I've seen. Yep. Uh, typically, if they're going to hold anything from that pattern, that's what I've noticed it, it is. It's you yeah. know, with a kind of a, a black snake with a little bit of a red hint, you know, uh, underlying on those bands. The white fades, but the, the red can remain. Yep. So when, when you get your babies, any issues getting them to eat? Or are they... There's some variation here as well, and I'll be interested to hear after what Clint says about his, but sure. I always try... Um, just plain old frozen thawed pinkies first, and the majority take frozen thawed pinks drop fed right away. For those that don't take frozen thawed, I try live next, 
Um, and most of them that don't didn't take the frozen thawed will take the live. And then after that, I'll try washed pinks or brained pinks or something like that. Um, the first couple of years, I didn't have any non feeders. Uh, the last two years, I did have um, this year just one, the year before two that were just totally non feeders. And I've tried um, like a short cooling period for those non feeders and then taking them back out. And like the one I just took out a couple of weeks ago, and he ate a brain pink, like first thing out of brumation. So hopefully he sticks with that. So that should work. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I've not had too much difficulty on getting these feeding. I uh, follow a similar pattern where, and this is with all of my Kaluber babies, it's I offer them a frozen thawed. If that doesn't work, it's it's literally I take the frozen thawed out and put a live in. It, it's just, that's my routine <laughs> as I'm going yeah. through the tub. Um, and I want to say there's only been maybe two, two to four, somewhere in there that refused both and i used boil pinks and that oh. did it immediately just bam that, that, that right on kicked it. it in that's boil pinks kind of my go-to i i, I don't get too fancy <laughs> with, i've never I, actually I, tried I, that for anything oh I, I will tell you i have probably like a 60 percent, 66 percent. so two out of three are going to take and that's with all colubrids that I do this with. I have about 66% success rate with boiled pinks. Um, but I kind of subscribe to the same school that Matt does. And that's, if after I've done a few of these little things, mm -hmm. if you're still not going to eat, then then you're, you're probably not going to make it. But I, I keep trying every single week. You know, those, those yeah. are done routinely. And it normally works eventually for just about, you know, everything. But uh, in the boiled pinks, just for those who are listening, uh, the way that I do that, take a frozen pinky, not a thawed pinky, a frozen pinky, not a live pinky. Yeah, a frozen don't do it pinky. alive, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Frozen, and I just toss it into uh, into boiling water for 30 seconds. Even 30 seconds, pull it out. By the time I walk in, you know, from, from the kitchen to the snake room, uh, it's already, it's warm, but it's, you know, not hot to the touch. Do you uh, test it? Is it al dente up. at that point? <laughs> it's yeah. I, I've I've tried a few. That's why I know thirty seconds is yeah. just right. Perfect. Yeah. Um, but uh, put it in a deli cup. Um, so yeah, I don't put it in their cage. They're they're being deli cupped at this point. Um, and it it, it works. Put them put them back in a tub, and uh, I think maybe it probably helps to to close it and just let it be a little darker in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's that boiled pink trick is the best that's thing. Crazy. I even have a, a guy that uh, a close friend, he works at uh, the shop and he's the one taking care of the animals the majority of the time now while I'm handling everything else. And uh, he had never done the, the boiled trick. And so when I taught him that, he's I, I say that had to be the greatest thing in 2022 <laughs> for him because he, he comes back and he's like, you know how many snakes I got to eat at my house? <laughs> you know, he had all these babies that work. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I had 29 feeders. Now I've only got three. You know, so. That's yeah, cool. I'm going to have to try that. And I, I know my wife's going to listen to this, so I'm just going to say now I will buy my own pot. Don't worry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. You could live dangerously and just use use the one in the in the kitchen. Would never nah, do that at my nah, house. I, I, I don't think I'm going to risk that one. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So – I know that we haven't really hit on it, but this is something that's kind of part of their biology. This is a species that's notoriously kept cool. Uh, one of the reasons why I got them here at the school is when I, they were one of like phase one of the development of the collection at West Liberty, black milks were on it. And the reason was I was so terrified about figuring out if we could actually keep things warm here. Um, and I knew that just the ambience that were in the labs were perfect for them. So what temperature are you keeping the babies at? Um, and, and do they stay at the same temperature as babies that you keep them at? Can you keep your adults at, or is it, does it change at all? Or is it kind of a one-stop shop with them? There's a little change. My hatchling rack is set to 80 degrees on the hot spot, but it is also back heat. Whereas my adults are mm -hmm. on belly heat and the adults are uh, on a 77 degree hot spot. Um, 
And in the summer, my snake room does occasionally get to be around 80 degrees ambient for, mm -hmm. for periods of the warm summer days, and they seem to do fine with that. Yep. PJ, same I'm thinking we're cut from the same cloth, my man. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, even, and it's not just the black milks, I'll keep uh, cocci, you know, all, all the different yep. bamboos. Uh, same way where I'll put the, the back heat, it's all back heat. Uh, and I'll set it to about 80, which tells me it's probably closer to a 78 inside the actual tub right. on that warm side. I, I think for me, I view it as a lot of these hatchlings, they're hatching out during the warmest time of the year in their climate. Yes. You know, and so that's what they would be coming out to. That's what their egg temperature was. Um, and so I do find that they tend to have a little bit better feeding response at that temperature rather than just straight room temperature uh when now that they're not hot uh, we don't have them right. hot don't get me wrong but uh having a little bit more uh warmth there the only ones as far as the asians that i that know don't do that is the mandarins they <laughs> yeah, put any know. heat on them whatsoever they don't want it but uh yeah even the, the cocci yeah. chinese king rats um you know the green bush you name it I give them some of that supplemental heat as well. And I think that that helps the babies. Uh, usually within about the six to 12 month range is where that starts going away. Um, kind of whenever I need to move them from that little bitty hatchling rack to something else is at that point, the heat's gone. Okay. So no heat for your adults, but your ambient's still kind of around that 77. Co correct. Correct. I okay. will, you know, as I'm, I'm thinking on my adults, because sometimes that room can get cool, you know, yeah. cause I've got it for the Asians. Um, so I want to say the black milks, I do have it like a, all my racks have supplemental heat. It's just whether or not it's on or what I've got right. it set to kick yeah. on at. And I want to say the black uh, milks are set to probably about 76, 77, just if it, you know, is dropping further than that. It, it, and it's a CB 70. So they've got that yeah. gradient, you know, they can get to where they're not even feeling any of that heat whatsoever if they want to. But, uh, I think at, at the peak, it's probably in, in the tub, maybe at about 75 is what I'm guessing their warm side is. Yeah. Interesting. So Zach in, yeah. when you were in Costa Rica, tell us a little bit about what mm -hmm. you actually experienced with the temps. Um, it, it, it's not as hot as people think, but it's not as cool as people think either. Uh, one of the things that I was just talking about this the other day. Um, so I grew up here in West Virginia, which is basically the mid-Atlantic. And here, like May and June are, are, are just nice. Our, our highs are usually, if it's not a weird year, we're getting to like 80, 81. But then the humidity, it's humid. But it's not like knock you on your ass humid. And then the end of June comes and we get into July and August. And I just want to get the hell out of here. Like it is a, it's a swamp. Um, and we have the forests here that trap that humidity. And you're kind of walking through the woods in um, insta sweat and can get a little rough. And I honestly feel after being in Costa Rica so many times um, that Costa Rica, that tropical rainforest that you go into where, where these guys live on the Caribbean side. Uh, it's more like May and June than it is July and August. Like it, I actually feel like it is more oppressive, nasty here when it's ripping um, than it is down there. Cause they've got basically there's, there's air, there's air currents that are kind of bringing the rain in. It rains a little bit, that heavy duty precipitate, uh, sorry, humidity kind of, it bottoms out, but it's in the soil. So it kind of slowly comes back every day. But you kind of got that release valve daily during the wet season in particular where you never get that, like, oppressive heat, humidity. It's just hot and humid. And I don't know if I'm making any sense, but if you've been in this part of the world, you totally get it. So I can see why they're kept cool. Um, the other thing that's important with these animals is that it's it, the climate is one thing, but the microclimates that the animals are actually living in are completely different. And one of the fun things I did, I've done every time I've gone down there, and I've been there like four times. I basically spent what equates to a little over a month of my life in 
Costa Rica now, um, is I temp gun everything. I just walk through the woods and like, how? what's the temperature of that tree hollow? What's the temper, temperature of the forest floor? It's 2 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock at night. It's, uh, you know, 7 o'clock, blah, blah, blah. And everything seems to be, like, if there was a default temperature for something, it's 74 degrees. Like, 74 degrees at 9 o'clock at night. It's 74 degrees at 9 o'clock in the day. If it's going to be hot, it's going to be, like, around 1 o'clock, and that's from 11 to 1 in the afternoon. It's hot. Like, that's when it can get oppressive. But it's only a two-hour window. It's not like here where it's, like, all damn day into the night. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes complete sense to me why people keep them around 77 and you have the hot spot of 80 and, you know, you let it drop into the upper 60s, lower 70s. And that's another thing that's been really kind of cool. And I'm not saying, like, this is the way all the time. Because if you're, if you're in this part of the world in um, the dry season – which is there March and April, it definitely is a little bit different. And I have been there in March and and April, actually, and it can get pretty warm. But you know how here you walk out on a 100-degree day and it's 9 o'clock at night and it's just disgusting? That, that does not happen down there. Like, every night it's going to drop down to 70, 68 degrees after, like, three or four hours. And the reason why that happens is because you're near the equator – and you have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. Up here, at our latitude, you have 14 hours of light and 10 hours of dark. And then you're getting more and more light. So you literally have less darkness up here to dissipate that temperature and drop it down than you do down, down there, where it's 12 and 12 pretty much all the time. I think technically it's like 13 hours of daylight and then whatever that Aquila braids to... Um, darkness but yeah but no i i totally get why it is what it is and with them going into burrows and crevices and being down on the forest floor makes total sense why they aren't seeking out that that heat and i think most people when they see them because they did do a little bit of a deep dive on them um they're seeing them in like the first couple hours of day and then like the last couple hours of night and you don't really see them out doing their thing in the middle part of the day and of course when it gets to be nighttime um, they're crepuscular, so they're going to be coming out, eating what they eat and doing what they do. So, yeah, pretty cool animals, though. Um, they are – I'm not going to be picking up many things in 2022 – or, sorry, 2023, but black milks are, like, on the very short list of things that are probably entering the Loafman household. <laughs> so – um, so you're gonna anyway. you're gonna pit Clint and I against each other to see who can produce the ones that are gonna <laughs> yeah. end up in your collection. Yeah, there we go. Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. Get on it, guys. <laughs> yeah, so I guess real quick, yeah. uh, touching on the color of the black milk yes. snakes, the theory I've heard is that they they turn black because they're from these cooler climates. It helps mm -hmm. them absorb more heat from the sun, so they can thermoregulate. That seems accurate to you. Yeah, I I think there's an element of truth to that. Um, I think too often. It, people kind of find the easiest explanation for why an animal does what it does. And mm -hmm. then they just make an assumption that that's it. And it makes complete sense for these animals that are, you know, need to attain heat to be black. But I think, I think it's, there's more than that. I think that's part of the puzzle. I think the other element of it is, uh, it, there's another snake that lives right alongside these guys that does the exact same thing. And that's the, um, Clelia, Clelia, the Musarana. It it hatches out as a. It's not technically a tricolor, but it, it it's mimicking um, the corals and all those guys. So it's a red and yellow snake, and then as it matures, it becomes a solid black, actually more of a slate black snake. And black milks do the exact same thing. They hatch out as a tricolor, and they are coral mimics, hundred percent. And then as they mature, they gradate into this all-black snake. And you know, that species of Musarana, you find it from Costa Rica down into Brazil. It gets at a fairly high elevation. It's also found down in the lowlands. So I, I, I think that being a large black snake has its advantage of simply, if you're hanging out in crevices and you're down on the forest floor, it's very easy for you to kind of, quickly dip up along a log where the log meets the ground and you've got a bit of camouflage there. So there's an evolutionary pressure there that leads to a little bit more survival because you're just harder to see 
And in these forests, it's pretty dark too. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I've always thought about that idea. Uh, but if that were the case, most of the snakes that are black for thermoregulation in their behavioral ecology, we see this behavior where they come out in the morning, they bask in the sunlight, uh, and then they're diurnal. They're like active the rest of the day. And when you look at the behavioral repertoire of a black milk snake, it's a crepuscular critter. It's coming out first couple hours of the day, not really active during the middle part of the day, and it's active at the late, you know, end of the day. So I'm sure retaining heat has something to do with it, but I'm not sure if that kind of classic e explanation is really why they undergo the change. And that is, for the record, part of the reason why I love this species of snake, because it's, you know, th you literally get a twofer when you raise one. You you've got this crazy, mm -hmm. you know, almost like a pyro, because the other thing about the babies, if you don't know much about the babies, if you're listening, is they're big. They are not Yo, little yeah, worms massive. at all. Oh, <laughs> no, no. No, they're, they're hefty. They're, yeah, they're hefty. And that that's something that I've always appreciated. Uh, well, the only thing I said this on the very first episode when we were talking about anything we don't like about colubrids, and I can honestly say, like, I love the king snakes, but those little worms that hatch out of the eggs, they're irritating. <laughs> I love my false water cobras because they're basically all pythons, like or boa, like they're they're the size of a baby boa constrictor when they're born. They are not tiny by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> they're eating rat pinks and fuzzies right off the bat. Uh, but the fun thing about black milks is they're up there. In fact, what do you feed them? I mean, are, are you feeding them large pinks as their first meal, or a yeah, pink I or? Yeah, just a, a, a standard pink. I'm not going for like the extra smalls like I do with rhinos, mm -hmm. but I'm sure they could take a larger one. Yeah, Oop. yeah, kind of the same. It's if I'm looking at at feeding more, it's multi, it's two pinks rather than going bigger. You, you know, it's yeah, gotcha. You had mentioned it earlier because it's like a, you know rat snakes are able to take you know a big thick meal and, and no problem, but with kings, I, I'm. I'm always a little, well, King's Milks, you know, the home, yep. I'm always a little more concerned with a regurge with them than mm -hmm. I am a rat snake. So if I'm going to go bigger, it's going to be more of what they're already eating rather than a bigger size, you know, prey item. Yep. Totally fair. So any final thoughts on black milks, like something we didn't talk about that you're like, oh, we didn't discuss that. Um, we I guess covering? one last super cool thing to mention about them and, and anyone who's kept them will know when they're growing, it seems like they are going in a shed every other day. Uh, they just like, <laughs> they eat and they shed constantly. Um, but yeah, they still grow quickly. And also once they reach that full jet black stage and they are deep in shed, uh, they're like a black and blue snake and it is, yeah, it is cool. pretty cool to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and when they're going through the, the change, you know, when they're still young and still have a lot of that red, you, you have to look at the eyes to figure out whether yeah. or not they are shedding. Because it's, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, it's, are they just yep. getting dark or are they actually, you know, mm -hmm. going into uh, That's you know, their cool. cycle? So it's, uh, uh, it's neat. They are a very, very neat species. Yep. And, and then you alluded to it, uh, gentle giants. Um, yes. They're one of the snakes that we, if we have students that are kind of hesitant to pick up the snakes, um, black milks are, are, are one of the th first colubrids that they work with. And then, in fact, they're so gentle that they kind of lull people into a false sense of security. And then you have a 20-year-old that thinks picking up a yellowtail crebo is a good idea, which is <laughs> kind of the opposite end of that spectrum. So uh, that has happened, by the way. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, yeah, the yeah, only no. thing I will say... Hey, you know, that you would want to watch out for with them is they do have a pretty strong feeding response. Yes. Once they yes. smell food, once, you know, there's movement. Um, yeah, it's they they that's when the lamp propeltus comes out. Yes. Honestly, it is, mm -hmm. you know, during that it's so much like the the Florida where I can't tell you how many of those I've had to catch in midair as they're grabbing the prey <laughs> and wrapping them and falling out of the, the tubs. Um, I have had it once or twice uh, with the black milks as well. Uh, not as much as far as shooting out of the tub, you know, like a, like a Brooks, uh, Florida, 
King will do. But uh, yeah, when it's feeding time, if you've got rodents in your room, keep oh, keep on. that in mind when putting mm-hmm. your hand in there because they're they're a little bit different at that point. All righty. Well, we're at the one hour fifty minute mark, which is normally when we like to wrap this thing up. So this has been great, guys. I've enjoyed talking yeah, it's to been both fun. of you. Well, what do you think it's of your first episode, great. Clint? <laughs> ah, man, I, I, I've had so much fun. I, I love that we had PJ on, you know, someone I, mm-hmm. I, we got to hang out together a little bit in Tinley this past year. Um, you know, so someone that I know, and uh, I think it's it's gone great. Uh, I'm looking forward to more. All right. Fantastic. So, How are you feeling, PJ? I'm yeah, feeling yeah. great. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Okay, well, we'll have you back on. You, you bred Molendorfs, and that's something that not everybody's done. So that's worthy of another conversation easily. So Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to come back. Absolutely. All right, cool. So if people want to get a hold of you, uh, how do they go about doing that? Sure. Uh, two ways. I'm on Instagram, at HandmadeHerps, all one word. And I'm on Morph Market as well. All right, there you go. And Clint, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, you can go Where's to Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Metazotics, M-E-T-A-Z-O-T-I-C-S. Uh, you can email me at metazotics at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, on Instagram, it's Metazotics LLC. Uh, or if you are ever in southern Indiana, anywhere close <laughs> to southern Indiana, 520 West Lincoln in Chandler, Indiana, right outside of Evansville. Come on in Ooh. and see us. Yeah, I, I have some field work in Kentucky this coming summer. Oh, yeah, really? What part? We will. Uh, what? Well, it's Eastern Kentucky. We'll start in Pikeville, which is or Pine Pine Pikeville. Yeah, but we'll make it all the way over to. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the town. It's we we got Harlan County down there, and then we'll make it up into Lexington. Um, okay. I and then three I'm hours picking up one it. of my students in Louisville. So uh, hour and a half. You got to come at it that all. point. Yeah. And we come down 75. So I know that we can just like dive off. Won't be a problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to it. I mean, that. really, if you're talking about get togethers mm-hmm. and Clint, you've got this shop now. I feel like some annual colubrid fest is, is going to start to be a thing. Oh, Ooh, I like hey, it. I mean, They've the carpet got, um, guys have their carpet fest yeah. and monitor guys we may have yeah. to think about that everybody remember that Ooh. that was stated here <laughs> so we'll have to give pj okay. credit for it he'll get a, uh-huh. get a plaque i'll that be there we're happen. thinking about <laughs> all righty well if you uh man i like the idea of that if um you want to get a hold of me uh dr crawdad with instagram uh zach Lofman with facebook obviously if you're students wanting a master's degree or you're a high schooler wanting to go to college in up west liberty reach out i have several incoming students in this coming fall podcast is finally doing one of its intended purposes which is to get people that want to kind of advance their their biology degrees and, and do this for a living i have some pretty cool projects on the horizon in herpet culture land but i don't want to let them out of the bag just quite yet so future episodes this point in the episode we'll be we'll be doing that so and Matt, wherever you are, hope we did a good job and we hit your standard because I know you're going to listen to this. So <laughs> there we go on that one. And um, yeah, so this has been second episode of 2023 of Blue Raid Radio. Uh, we're happy to be members of the Marillion Python Radio Network. And whatever time you're listening to this, hope it's been a good day. Later. Later.